He's definitely great this morning. There's none like him. Amen. There's a lot of, as we say, I say anyway, a lot of little G-gods in this world, but there's only one big G-god. Amen. And there ain't nothing compared to him. So we uh, praise him this morning for his goodness. I'm going to ask you, if you will, to turn your Bibles this morning to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. How about that? Jeremiah chapter 23. Amen. All right. Everybody found your place to say amen this morning. All right. Hold your finger there. Malachi chapter 1. We're just going to be in Malachi chapter 1 just for one second. I just want to share one verse out of there with you. One thing we have to remember that the, uh, in studying our Bible and in uh, going into the Scripture is that the books of the uh, uh, Bible, especially the Old Testament, are not put in what we have access to in chronological order. Now, I'm sure some of you have uh, chronological Bibles, no doubt, but... Um, I, I'm going to share two different passages of Scripture with you this morning, and they're separated actually by about 400 years, but um, they all made the same point in talking to the same group of people as far as the nation of Israel. Um, so if you look in Malachi chapter 1 first, and I'm going to ask you to stand, if you will, in honor of the reading of God's Word if you're able this morning. Now I just want to share this first verse with you just to... Because uh, this is going to be what our topic is today. Malachi chapter 1 verse 1, the scripture reads, The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. The burden of the word of the Lord. That's what I want to speak to you about this morning. Alright, now go back over to Jeremiah chapter 23. Going to look at two verses here beginning in verse 28. Jeremiah 23:28 The scripture reads the prophet that hath a dream let him tell a dream and he that hath my word let him speak my word faithfully what is the chaff to the wheat saith the lord is not my word like a fire saith the lord and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. Father, we love you and we praise you today. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you for your presence in this house, Lord. And we uh, pray, God, that there will always be a house that is dedicated and focused upon you and uh, not on us. Lord, we love you today. We thank you uh, for all you've done and all you're going to do. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. The burden of the word of the Lord. Now, I know I probably say this to you many times, but I'm going to say it one more time this morning as far as Jeremiah being one of my favorite books of the Bible. Um, you say, well, preacher, you said Isaiah was. Well, yeah, it is too. Um, I could name off many of them that are just, uh, that God has really, really used to speak uh, to my heart, no doubt, throughout the years, and Jeremiah being one of them. Now, if you know anything about Jeremiah, Jeremiah was a, a prophet who that uh, God used to not only uh, preach and prophesy before the 70 years captivity in Babylon, but also going into the 70 years of the captivity of Babylon. He was a man called from God that was a, no doubt, touched, uh, 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 the heart of God had touched his heart and life, called him into the ministry, and I believe, and one of the reasons that I find this book so interesting and uh, find this book that, I, that just touches me in such a way is because I believe Jeremiah was given one of the hardest ministries that has ever been given in the Scripture. There's many men and women in the Scripture who put their lives on the line and uh, did many things, but uh, through their ministry we often see that they had results. Well, Jeremiah was a man who had no results. Jeremiah 
was a man who poured his heart and his life into the ministry that God gave him. And we know him, many people know him as the weeping prophet. And that is the reason that he is called the weeping prophet because he had such, he had such a struggle. He had a burden of the word of the Lord. Now I'm not going to say and I'm going to prove to you this morning that the burden of the word of the Lord is not necessarily a bad thing. The fact that Jeremiah never won, as far as we know, had one person repent and turn to God. That maybe not wasn't necessarily a bad thing. Now I'll explain that later and get to this. But what I'm talking about is in his own personal life. In his own personal life. See, God can raise up anyone he wants to. God can use anybody he wants to if they'll be willing. I think Jeremiah had an experience with God that was unique to any other person in the Bible because of this ministry that God had given him. Now, in this scripture that we've jumped into here in chapter 23, we find where here God is giving him a prophecy or giving him a word to share with the priest with the other priests and prophets of his day. Now God had addressed, and Jeremiah, uh, through the word of God, had addressed the people earlier. I would love to take the time to share uh, that with you, but I'm just going to sum it all up in one verse in what God said to the people, and it's found in Jeremiah chapter number uh, 7. In Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 28, God says this, But thou shalt say unto them, talking about the nation of Israel, talking about uh, more distinctly the children of Judah. He said, This is a nation that obeyeth not the voice of their God, nor receiveth correction. Truth is perished and is cut off from their mouth. You could sum that up and you could sum all of uh, what God thought about the people and the way the people were accepting the message that Jeremiah had through that one verse um, in a nutshell, if you want to say. But as we get into chapter 23, he is now talking to the leadership. He's now talking to the priest and prophet of that day. And I want to share just a little bit of what he said. He's, he, in verses 11 through 17 of chapter 23, if you want to look there, it says, For both prophet and priest are profane. Yea, in my house have I found their wickedness, saith the Lord. Wherefore their ways shall be unto them as a slippery ways in the darkness. They shall be driven on and fall therein, for I will bring evil upon them even the year of their visitation, saith the Lord. And I have seen folly in the prophets of Samaria. They prophesied in Baal and caused my people Israel to err. I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem a horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of evildoers that none doth return from his wickedness. They are all of them unto me as Sodom and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I will feed them with wormwood and make them drink the water of gall. For from the prophets of Jerusalem is profaneness gone forth into all the land. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. They say still unto them that despise me. They, The Lord has said, You shall have peace. And they said unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, No evil shall call upon you. Now what God is saying in this scripture, God is saying that these prophets and these priests are not called by me. He said, they're not giving you my word, they're giving you their word. They're not giving you my word, they're giving you their opinion. They're telling you that the way you're living is okay. They're telling you that you do what you want to and everything will be all right. And that's basically what he's saying in the Scripture. That's why I didn't share this with you, but um, I would definitely encourage you to read chapter 7 and chapter 8 of Jeremiah. Those are actually my two favorite chapters of this whole book. And the reason being because God told Jeremiah to go and stand on the front steps of the, per of the church 
In that day, of course, it was the porch of the temple told him to go stand on the front steps of the church and when the people came out of the church, preach the word to them because they sure ain't getting it inside. Read it. You'll find it in there. That's exactly what he said. So folks, I want you to understand God was not happy with the leadership. God was not happy with the people. God was, uh, this is some of the hardest scripture that you'll ever read in your life is found in the book of Jeremiah. Why? Because God went to where the rubber meets the road. Now, in verses 21 through 26, I want to just share that with you briefly too and then we'll get into uh, the heart of the message. Now in this scripture, he proves that fact. God is saying here, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do I not feel, do not I feel heaven and earth, saith the Lord? I have heard what the prophet said that prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yeah, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart. As I said, I want to talk to you about this morning about the burden of the Word of the Lord. I want to give you four things this morning briefly, and I'll go just as quick as I can concerning this. First of all, I want us to see that this is a process. I I know I say that to you all the time, so I'm just going to get you to look at your neighbor this morning, look at your neighbor and say, Neighbor, it's still a process. It's still a process. And I want you to see the progress. You've heard me say that many times. You've got to make progress in the process. We're going to see some progress in the process in this Scripture today. Now, for us, for the application of this Scripture to our lives, to this, uh, the ministry of Jeremiah, Jeremiah, no doubt, was a man who not only struggled with the ministry that God gave him, but also struggled with himself. Chapter 20, um, you can look in chapter 20, and there is a passage of Scripture, I believe it's found in verse number 9, where Jeremiah says, Lord, I'm never going to speak your name again to the people. They won't listen, basically, and I'm paraphrasing. Nobody's listening to what i got to say. I'm getting persecuted on every side. My family's turned against me. I've been thrown in a well. I've been, all this stuff has happened. They want to kill me. They want to cast me in prison. They want to do all these things. Nobody's listening, and I'm not going to speak your name again. The end of that verse, he says, but. Hey, ain't that an awesome word? That word, but. Thank God I was a sinner headed to hell, but. Praise God, but Jesus went and died on an old rugged cross for him. So he says, but your, fire, your word was burning in my bones like a fire. Now here in chapter 23, God is asking Jeremiah this same question. Is my word not like a fire? He is reminding Jeremiah of what he had talked to him about. So let me say, in our own personal lives, many times in the the beginning of the process of living our lives for Christ, of becoming a Christian, and I want to say of becoming a mature Christian, many times keeping the Word of God seems like a burden, does it not? I mean, let's just be honest with one another this morning. Keeping the Word seems like a burden. And the reason that it is is because so often we don't realize the purpose of the Word. Especially concerning the Old Testament law. See, the fact is, if you are trying to, if you are trying to keep the the Word of God and you are basing your salvation upon how good that you can keep the Word of God, let me tell you, you're as lost as you ever was and you don't understand anything about law and grace. 
So, the purpose of the Word of God, the Scripture says that it is our schoolmaster. The law is our schoolmaster. The law uh, uh, reveals sin to us, and it reveals our inability to keep it. Amen? Let me tell you something. When I get into the Scripture and I begin to read, uh, not just the, you know, we talk about the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament, but let me tell you something. When you get into the New Testament, it's even, it's even more strict. It's even more, um, if you want to look at it that way, it's even more demanding than the Old Testament. Because Jesus said, look, the Old Testament says that if you commit adultery, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery. But Jesus said, I say that if you look at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery already. He says, in the Scripture, He says, the the, the Ten Commandments say, Thou shalt not kill. He says, but if a man hateth his brother, in the New Testament, Jesus said, if a man hateth his brother, he has committed murder. So let me tell you, the New Testament is even more demanding in the Old Testament, but the purpose of the law is to help you understand the fact that you can't keep it in your need for God's amazing grace. All right, so keeping the Word and the teaching or the um, understand, gaining the understanding of the law is the first step in the process. Secondly, I want you to understand that the Word keeping you eases the burden. All right, now what this is, that might not, not make a whole lot of sense to you, but I hope we'll get, bring it all together. When I say that, what I'm saying is in the first step of the process, you are understanding the law. The law is fulfilling its purpose in you, hopefully, and letting you realize that you don't have the ability to keep it. In the second step of the process, you learn to allow the law to, Uh, to keep you, allow the Word to keep you, which in turn helps ease the burden of the law. Why? Because of God's amazing grace. All right, and you understand through that that even though I can't keep the law, it's not about what I can do or what I did. It's about what Christ did on the cross and what Christ can do. Amen? Amen? And then when you understand that, see, the burden's not so heavy anymore because it's not based anymore on you, it's based on Him. And as long as you're looking at you, you always are going to fall short of the glory of God. The Scripture plainly tells us that. And the Bible even tells us that the wages of sin, the wages of falling short of the glory of God is death. But praise God, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So I tell you, if when it comes down to that, I'd a whole lot rather look at Him than look at me. I'd a whole lot rather talk about what He did than what I can do. Praise God, let me tell you, you've got to take the next step. Many people that have been saved for many, many years are still battling with the law and the grace. The law and the grace. Praise God. Look, I'm not proud of my past, but I know my past is covered, and I'm going to live like I didn't do any of it. Amen? Because that's the way, that's what grace is. It is the uh, uh, unmerited, undeserved favor of God that He wipes the slate clean. And the good thing about my God is He wipes it clean every day. Now sure, we've all made mistakes, and sure, hopefully we learn from our mistakes on a day-to-day basis, if not an hour-by-hour or minute-by-minute basis. But I praise God that He fills the gap. That He stands in the gap. So keeping the Word seems like a burden, but the Word keeping you eases the burden. And then as I've told you many times, becoming the Word is the third step. 
Once you understand law and its purpose and it's where it fits into your life and you understand grace and you understand its purpose and you understand how it fits into your Christian life, let me tell you something, then you'll begin to become the Word. You'll begin to become the Word and see that helps you understand the burden. Because the burden has not went away. Malachi, a man of God, we read uh, uh, Malachi 1.1, the burden of the Word of the Lord that came to Malachi. Read the rest. Uh, verse number 2, he talks about, or on down through there, he begins to talk about how God says, well, if I'm, if I'm your father, why don't you honor me? Malachi too was given a very hard ministry, given a very strong word, a word that many churches today would not accept. Uh, uh, many Christians would not accept. But let me say, praise God, it was a burden upon his heart. Why? Because God gave it to him. You know, I, as, a, as a pastor, I wish, uh, and I'm going to say this because we have touched on this, as a uh, there's one thing I know in there. If there's one thing I know in my life, let me say, I know that God called me to preach, and that's because I didn't want to do it. And there's still time, I'll be honest with you, there's still times in my life right now I don't want to do it. But what I have found out, I, because I quit doing it uh, for about a year one time, trying to get away from it, and figured out that it was a burden in my life, it was something in my heart that I could not get away from. And it wasn't because I put it there, it's because He put it there. I wish sometimes that I could explain um, to, and I've tried to explain, and no doubt not done it justice, of the burden that God puts on a heart of a pastor, of a God-called pastor, for the sheep that he has been given responsibility over. I, can't, I, I couldn't even begin to do it justice. How, how do you have such a great love for such a people that you don't just you barely know? Let's just put it like that. So you begin to understand the, the burden as you become the Word, as the Word, uh, the uh, book of Hebrews refers to the Word as the engrafted Word. That it becomes a part of you. That it's like a skin graft when they uh, you know, take skin off one part of your body and put it somewhere else. Now, I've never had that done, but I've always heard uh, once it heals and once it uh, uh, really uh, begins to take shape and all that, that that uh, part becomes the strongest part of your body, of your skin. It's been engrafted in, and folks, um, this is the engrafted Word, and when we begin to understand the purpose of the Word, the Old Testament law, the New Testament grace, and when we begin to put that, apply that into our lives, we begin to become the Word. It becomes engrafted into us, and then through that, we begin to understand the burden that God has put on our heart. And as Taylor said this morning so wonderfully, praise God, it gives us purpose gives us purpose. But not only purpose, it gives us appreciation for the purpose. I've told people in my life, you know, I, uh, God has blessed me with good help. God has blessed me uh, with a lot of things over the years. And, and um, you know, and there's a lot of other things that I have no doubt that I could do and make a living. I've done that before. God has blessed us in that way. But I've always said preaching is the hardest thing, or pastoring, not the preaching part. The pastoring is the hardest thing I've ever done, but it's the most fulfilling thing I've ever done. It's the thing when you begin to step into your calling for the Lord and that calling and that purpose that God has given you becomes first place in your life. Let me tell you, you'll give it be to the place where you can't be happy doing anything else. Why? Because, let's just put it like this. Right, look at your neighbor this morning and say, Neighbor, God completes me. In fulfilling your purpose in Him, will make you feel whole. will make you feel complete. So you must understand keeping the Word seems like a burden. The word, and word keeping you eases the burden and becoming the Word helps you understand the burden. But sharing the Word, and this is where Jeremiah was at, 
sharing the Word, promoted progress in his life. Power in his life. The presence of God in his life. And can I say today, passion. Passion. Despite the results. See, when you, I've, I've come to learn and I've learned this and I'm still in the process of learning this, it's not always necessarily about, I don't want you to take this the wrong way, it's not always necessarily about the results. Even though we all want results. Even though God, and I'm talking about in your soul winning. I'm not talking about anything other than that. I'm talking about in your soul winning. Because Jeremiah had no results. If it was based upon results, he would be at the bottom of the totem pole. But the fact that he was willing to share, the fact that he was willing to speak God's Word when it wasn't popular, the fact that he was uh, uh, able to speak the, the hard word of God, the judgment of God, to this people prophesy of the fact that they were going to go into 70 years of captivity to the uh, Babylonians, to, uh, and, and all of that, the fact that he was willing promoted him in his Christian life, promoted him in his life, his relationship with God, it wasn't result-based, it was relationship-based. And as long as he kept it relationship-based, God would instruct him of his next step, of his next move. When I think about all of that, I must think about the Lord, Jesus Christ. And the heart for ministry that Christ had. I think particularly of a passage of Scripture that's found in Matthew chapter 23 where Jesus was standing there and He was looking out over Jerusalem and He uh, said to the people, He said to the people there, He said, I would have gathered you together as a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not. Christ was saying, I, I, I tried, I, I did what I could, and I tried to get you to follow me, I tried to get you to listen to me, but you wouldn't. And He says, and therefore, I leave you a desolate land. You can read the Scriptures, uh, Matthew 23, verse 37 through 40. Read it sometime. Some of the saddest Scripture in the Bible, because Jesus had given up on them. Basically, at that point. He tells us in the Scripture, Mark 8, and it's found in uh, Matthew, it's found in Luke also, that says, Christ said, If any man will come after me, let him deny, deny himself, right? Take up his cross, take up his burden, and follow me. Folks, so often we look at the things that we do for God and the things that uh, I say that we do for Him. He don't need us to do anything for Him. but He blesses us with the privilege and the um, honor to be able to try to continue the ministry that He has so graciously left us with. And so many times, so many people look at coming to church as a burden. Coming to Sunday school is a burden. Coming to Wednesday night is a burden. Reading my Bible every day and studying the Word is a burden. Witnessing, telling people about Christ, uh, not just inviting people to church, but telling people about uh, Christ. Let me just say this to you today. The church ain't never saved nobody. Only Jesus of the church. The Christ of the church. Yes, we want them here. We want them to get here. We want them to experience what we experience. We want to draw them into the presence of the Lord. But let me tell you something. If they put their faith and trust in the church, they'll die and go to a devil's hell. Their faith has to be in the God of the church, in the Christ of the church. 
I have to give the, the Holy Spirit of the church the freedom to work and move in their life. So what I want you to get out of this scripture today, this is what God gave me out of this scripture, is, is this one fact that the, the burden of the Word of the Lord is not a burden in itself. It's really the blessing of the burden of the Word of the Lord. I can remember a time in my own life, and maybe you can too here today, where the Word meant nothing to me. You know, I never will forget when God was... And yes, my daddy brought me up in church. He, uh, I think he started pastoring his first church when I was about four years old. And yes, we were, and I've told you all this, we were in every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, every Bible school. And you know, and you know, some of y'all will remember this. So I probably used to do it here. You know how you have Sunday school on Sunday and then preaching? You used to have training union on Sunday night and then preaching. Y'all, did y'all have that here? Uh, training you. So we did all that when I was uh, coming up in my mom and daddy's house and every Bible school, every revival, and revivals wasn't these three-day little cotton candy feel-good preaching like you get today. Revivals used to last sometimes two, three, four, five weeks. And you best believe we was there to every night, every single one of them, unless we was on our death. If we wasn't in the hospital, we was at church. We didn't stay homesick. I'll put it like that in the bed. If we wasn't in the hospital, we was at church. Folks, people look at all these things that God has given us, and I'm going to use the word to do, but that's just because of a lack of better words. We look at them as burdens, but they're really blessings. See, here's the deal. Here's the purpose of the law in my life. If I go two or three days without getting in this Bible and start seeking out God's face in it and His presence, you know what happens? I feel guilty. That's the purpose of the law. But God's amazing grace says if you'll repent of your sins, I'll wipe the slate clean. And you will have learned a lesson from it. If you didn't like feeling like that, maybe you'll learn a lesson from it. Isn't it amazing? What did, the, what did uh, many of Jesus' disciples call him? Rabbi? Teacher? Isn't it amazing how he teaches us through our mistakes? Folks, I'm glad I wouldn't have it any other way than to have the burden of the word of the Lord. If I was to miss church as much as some of y'all do, I would feel so guilty. Amen? That's the burden of the word of the Lord. If I put as little money in the offering plate as some of y'all do, amen, I would feel so guilty. That's the burden of the word of the Lord. I'm so glad I got that burden because that burden completes me. That burden makes me whole. That burden, uh, let's just use Jesus' word. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus said this, he said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. He said, and I will give you rest. He said, take my yoke upon me. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. And he said, and I'll give you rest for your soul. Verse 30 says this, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Isn't that amazing? For my yoke, Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden's light. Let me just say it like this. If you have done, if you lived anything like I've lived in my past, that burden of sin that I was carrying was much heavier than this burden of God's amazing grace that I got now. What I seem to find out is that this burden of grace 
usually carries me more than I carry it. What an amazing God that we serve this morning. Let's stand if you would. Invitation simply this this morning if as well if I, as I always say if God has spoken to your heart we definitely want you to come no matter what the reason or what he's speaking to you about personally. If you're here and don't know Christ as personal Lord and Savior we definitely want to invite you to come this morning. But folks we want God my desire for you to grow my desire for you my desire for myself is that God would just continue to enlighten us in his word and open our eyes to not only the purpose of the word but how the word helps us fulfill our purpose that our purpose is found in it and our purpose is lived out through it and our joy, Jesus said, I'll leave you, I'll give you joy, not like the world gives you. He said, but my joy I give you. Joy, a joy that will remain through the good times, through the bad times, through the struggles, through the tears, through the ups and downs of life. What Jesus is saying is, I can make you whole. I can make you whole. You come to him today if he's spoken to your heart. Mm-hmm.